This is level one of the CFA program, the topic on ethics and professional standards. And the second recording from this very long reading on guidance for standards one through seven and ethics applications. These LOSs are identical for all seven. And let me go ahead and remind you as well that we have made seven recordings for the seven standards. I'll go ahead and probably emphasize my personal favorite in there. Look at that middle one, distinguish between conduct that conforms and violates. And if you look at those uh, 30 some questions at the end of this reading, uh, it sounds to me like a majority of them ask the question that sounds something like, all right, did this member or did this candidate in, was he or she in violation of a particular standard? So I, I think if we can focus on on that second one will probably lead into the first one and into the third one. So here we are. We've done professionalism. Now we'll move to integrity of capital markets. Remember, there were four components under the professionalism standard. Here we just have two. Let me go ahead and remind you as well of what we learned from Eugene Fama back in one of our equity readings. Recall that Eugene Fama taught us uh, something about stock market efficiency that sounded like stock prices reflect all relevant information. Things like dividends, things like quality of the assets, things like uh, the executive committee, things like the board of directors, right? Those are really super important uh, components of relevant information. And so once we move into this standard, we're kind of, we're kind of just assuming that the information is relevant, but now we need to distinguish between whether or not it has been made public or if it is still private information. And so the, the standard tells us that if we possess material, non-public information, that uh, we need to keep it in the vault. You guys ever watch Seinfeld? They put it in the vault and uh, and they're not allowed to tell anybody else. Of course, none of the four ever keep something in the vault. So. We're not going to act like uh, Seinfeld and his friends. All right, what constitutes material information? All right, so look down at the bottom just quickly. You know, they may include all the things I said before, periodic earnings, products, management shakeups, bankruptcies. I mean, almost anything that you can think of that you can find not only inside of the financial statements, inside of the management discussion, uh, reading the Wall Street Journal. I mean, any, any public source out there uh, you know, it's fairly obvious now that we've gotten to, you know, nearly the end of level one for all of us to decide whether something is material or not. But let's look up at that embedded bullet point at the top there. Power to significantly alter. Ah, boy, that the securities price is going to be impacted. I have a relatively personal story about material non-public information. Uh, years and years ago, I think we go, go all the way back to uh, 1996, 1997, somewhere in there, uh, we were delivering our MBA program to a relatively large corporation. I'm sure you've heard of these people. I won't tell you the name. But what they had done is, uh, is they had decided to take over an, another company. And I, I taught this class on a weekly basis. And so between the Wednesday and the following Wednesday, this company had announced a big takeover. Uh, it was several billion dollars. And so I, I was delivering the, the MBA program to about 40 of the uh, to their leadership team. And I came in that following Wednesday and I said, hey, thanks a lot for uh, for sharing that material non-public information with me last Friday because I could have gone to the options market and I could have made tons and tons of money. And they all laughed. Of course, I was joking. I'm, I'm joking now and I was joking back then. And they they all said, boy, we didn't uh, we didn't know anything about it. It just it hit us like a ton of bricks like it like it did the market. But if you do some if you do some research uh, and I won't tell you the name of the company, but uh, you know that was a, it was an administrative assistant that was making copies, and uh, I believe the administrative assistant told uh, somebody that she knows, and there was there was uh, a bunch of people were uh, arrested by the uh, by the SEC. So anyway, uh, securities price is unaffected. Actually, the target firm stock price doubled in that in that week. So that sounds an awful lot to me, like. Uh, 
material non-public information. Yeah, yet to be disseminated. So if the middle executive team and you know part of the upper executive team didn't know about it, well then that's probably a clear sign that it has yet to be disseminated. And so this is what you need to know. So look at that second arrow point there. What is considered public information? Well, can it reach a wide audience? Has it, is there some reasonable expectation that when the information is released that, that it's out there? I mean, think about a silly example. You guys know I love to give silly examples just so you remember the concept. But you know, suppose that you're a board member and, you, uh, and you've and you decided to take over another company and uh, that evening you go out to get your mail when you come home and you, you shout it out to, your, to an empty neighborhood. You say, oh, we're taking over XYZ company. Is that, I mean, you shouted it out, right? And it's in, it's in the public. I guess the air, that's kind of public, but clearly that's not, uh, that's not public dissemination of information. So what do you need? I mean, you need press releases, Wall Street Journal articles. You know, we'll talk in a little bit about uh, about social media. And of course, that that's an outlet, but you have to be super careful not to release it to just a select few. You know, maybe your, maybe your Facebook friends, you could say that's public, but that's only, you know, how many people? I don't know, 20. Do I even have 20 friends if I had Facebook? Would I, would I even have 20 friends? I don't know. And then look down at the bottom there. Should not use that information for personal benefit. So once again, put it in the vault. Now I love I love this mosaic theory here. Uh, notice what we've put in in green highlighted there. Knit together bits of information. So this is what we're being trained to do. We're being trained to look at the financial statements and read the Wall Street Journal. And and I use this analogy regularly when I talk about due diligence put on our working gloves, get the shovel out and work hard. You know, what are we going to do? We're going to talk to the people over there on the supply chain, talk to the people over here on the supply chain, talk to anybody that we know so that we can gather information. And if we get this, I'm going to repeat what's in green. If we knit together bits of information that's not generally known to the public and then analyze that information to draw some kind of an inclusion, well, then this is okay. But notice the arrow point there. We're not going to be in violation of this standard unless the information comes directly from the subject company. So you can talk to all the people around here. Like, for example, if you were evaluating a company like Walmart or Target or Best Buy, you could stand in the parking lot and you could say something like to all the people coming out, maybe they're all coming out empty handed and you interview them and you say, hey, you didn't buy a TV in there. And they say, well, yeah, those people in there, uh, they weren't very helpful. They, the TVs in there weren't of high quality. I'm going somewhere else. So if you did this, you gather all this information, right? There's, there's not a Wall Street Journal article out there that says something like, you know, Best Buy customers are unsatisfied. Of course, I'm making this up now. Uh, Best Buy is one of my one of my favorite stores uh, at which to shop. Now, of course, what uh, the institute is very interested in us doing is, you know, performing our due diligence, getting the shovel out, and working hard. But, but just to be on the safe side. They want us to keep records of our research activity. And so when you're standing in the parking lot, maybe you have, uh, maybe you have a, your phone on record and you, have, and you have all that stuff so that you can say, oh yeah, I did this, I did that, I did that. And based on that stuff, plus Wall Street Journal articles, plus uh, financial statements, uh, I came to this conclusion. And so this is perfectly fine. Now here's what I was telling you just a little bit earlier about, uh, about social media. Yeah, what does it read there in that second sentence? You know, membership limitations. So you need to make sure that the information is publicly available. Web pages, print media, press releases, right? Notice that very bottom arrow point. What do we say to you? Social media must not benefit a few at the expense of the majority. So look for, look for an exam question that kind of leads you to believe that there's only a select group of people, even if that select group is a lot of people like I don't know, 10,000 or some number. Uh, that's still not out there in the entire public arena. Now, I've said this to you in multiple recordings that the Institute doesn't require us to be lawyers or estate planners or tax accountants, but they expect us to know a lot of stuff. 
And when we don't know everything, are we allowed to go out and ask experts? And the answer is, of course. Of course, we're allowed to consult the experts on you know almost anything that we want that's related to our research. And we can even pay them uh, without violating this particular standard. Now, let's go ahead and read that arrow point. This is a super important one. Members and candidates are ultimately responsible for ensuring that they are not requesting or acting on confidential information received from these experts. And so this is a relatively easy conversation to have that sounds something like, OK, uh, I'm, you're going to help me out. I'll even pay you. You know, what is your source of information? I mean, that's an easy question to ask. Now notice the last bullet point down. Experts usually require both parties to sign a disclosure agreement. That makes perfect sense. Uh, now how about, uh, how about our research reports? Hmm. Now let's suppose that I'm Jim and I'm this, this really special research analyst and whenever I open my mouth, uh, people listen. You guys ever watch that great movie, uh, Trading Places, where they all, at the very end of the movie, they all lean in. Uh, to listen to and hear the uh, orange crop report. You know, let's suppose that I'm, <clears throat> I'm that person and I'm super important and everybody listens to what I have to say. Well, I have to be, I have to be super careful about what, uh, what's going to happen when I open my mouth. All right, some recommendations. Encourage the issuing company to make a material information public release. Of course, if we're, uh, if we're an analyst and we're evaluating a company and we visit that company and we find this information and we talk to them about it, we talk to the board, we talk to the executive leadership team, and these individuals say, oh yeah, this is private information now. We're going to make it public next week because we're planning on doing something really special with a new web page launch or something like that. And our response should be, boy, the sooner that you do it, the better. Why don't we do it right now? <laughs> Therefore, it becomes public immediately. All right, compliance procedures. I talk about this regularly about the need to have a compliance officer or a compliance department so that we have our own set of rules and procedures. We need to make sure we disclose those. And then we, we, we can also have conversations that we've had before about firewalls so that, uh, you know, we've got one silo over here and one silo over here. And do these people go and have lunch together and they talk to each other? And that's probably, uh, that's probably um, a scenario under which there could be a violation of this uh, dissemination of non-public information. All right, let's take a look at a quick sample question here. What are we doing? We're evaluating Under Armour. So stock price, what is that? Around 20 bucks, peak of around $50. Hmm. So we analyzed the financial statements, which show a net loss of $48 million. So that, that, can't, be, that can't be good news. But here, I'm going to go ahead and say this. This has nothing to do with the question. You know, we're digging and we're doing our research. So we see a net loss. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do at that point? We're going to say something like, all right, let's go ahead and start at the top of the income statement. Let's go ahead and look at all of the line items on the left hand side of the income statement. And let's say, why, why do we have a net loss? Do we have too few revenues or do we have too many expenses? Or what are those expenses? What kind of uh, depreciation methods have we have we chosen? I mean, all that stuff that we've talked about in level one and we'll continue to talk about it in levels two and three those are really important but then i'm going to go ahead and say this to you now remember uh, we talk about capital structure we talk about dividend policy and we talk about the cash flow statement regularly but what we'll learn as we go forward is that uh, net loss can be massaged and manipulated uh, but operating cash flow and free cash flow uh, not quite so much and so the next thing ought to be, there ought to be a sentence here that says something like, OK, uh, operating cash flow is also negative. Boy, that's a super bad sign that the quality of the assets are not nearly what the executives have thought they might be. <clears throat> all right, forget about all that stuff that I just talked about. Put that in the back of your brain as good steps in the due diligence process of performing a research analysis. 
So here's these, these last two here. Boy, what are we going to do? We're going to pick up the phone and we're going to call a bunch of people, right? Who are these? Ten critical suppliers. Then we're going to pick up the phone and call a bunch of consumers, okay? This is where we are standing out in the parking lot. Hmm. So after we do this thorough analysis, Ricardo concludes that we're going to sell this particular stock based on clearly what's publicly available, right? The net loss and then maybe a negative operating cash flow. But then the 10 critical suppliers, I mean, there's probably not a Wall Street Journal article about that. The consumers, there's probably not a Wall Street Journal article about that. But it's still information that's out there that is you know, I don't want to use this term, but I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and use it anyway. Relatively public. I mean, it's in the public universe. So it's our job as we're digging out there with our with our shovels to uncover this and to make an informed decision. So what's the answer here? Yeah, no, uh, Ricardo has not violated. This is a super example of mosaic theory. How about market manipulation? All right, must not engage in practices that distort prices or artificially inflate trading volume. So this is important, and I'm so delighted that the Institute is emphasizing not only the change in prices or the distortion in prices, but also trading volume, because you can do, you can, you can engage in practices that increase the trading volume and your first thought might be well you know what we don't know when it's going to go up or go up down but remember there are these whole groups of derivative securities that are based on uh, volatility and so if you can increase volatility then let's just say your option contracts are are more valuable so it's important to remember that this has two components it has the distortion of prices component and then the artificially inflate the trading volume all right so market manipulation you probably know this definition without even reading uh, this slide or the handbook deceive market participants uh, so what does this mean market manipulation this goes back to what we call in the academic world adverse information or adverse selection where you're trading with somebody who knows more than you do and that of course is something that you never want to do but the consequence of market manipulation look at that last arrow point there lowers the confidence of all investors information-based manipulation and transaction-based manipulation. So let's go start with information-based and start with this concept of pump and dump. Now, pump and dump has had, uh, you know, kind of two points in history where it was more popular. That's not a great word. How about more common? You know, in the 1920s, during the roaring 20s, remember, there, there, was no, uh, there, were, there were no computers, right? There was no... Uh, uh, there was no anything, right? It was just people talking to each other. Did they even have the phone back in 1929? I think they had phones back in 1929. So here, here's the deal. What lots of people would do, and, and these were, these were uh, you know, well-informed traders. What they would do is they would start buying some shares of stock, and then they would go out into the gossip market, whatever that meant. And they would start saying things like, oh, this company over here, Boy, they had some bad earnings here. Look at the bad earnings. I'll show you their report. But I just talked to their executives and they have this new idea and man, this stock is going to take off. And so rumors and innuendo and gossip and all that stuff. And so what we do is we get all these shares of stock. We buy them at a lower price. Our fellow marketers, you know, uh, pump up the price on poor and inaccurate information. And then we sell pump and dump. So that was the first section that was super common. But then, of course, when we hit the, our internet age, you know, what was that? 1998, 2000, 2002, whenever that, whenever that was, then we had, oh my gosh, all of these online stuff where people could go in and easily say something like what they did in 1929. But now, Instead of relying on the rumor mill, we rely on these uh, networks. And of course, with the advent of Instagram and Facebook, um, boy, it's, uh, it's super easier to do this nowadays than it was back in 1929.
know, how about transaction-based manipulation? Look at look at the arrow point in the example. Back and forth trades between two individuals. So what we say is that, you know, I'm over here and you guys are wherever you are, but we have an agreement and I'll say something like, here, I'll sell you a thousand of my shares. So you buy a thousand of my shares. And then I'll say, hey, you know what? I'll buy them back, you know, 27 minutes later. So, you know, we, we just do this back and forth and back and forth. And so all of a sudden people are looking at this and remember they're not only are there technicians, but there are other uh, market watchers. Uh, you know, we have the Bloomberg terminals at, at our school. And so, you know, my students can sit there while I'm lecturing them and they can raise their hand and say, oh, hey, Jim, guess what's happening uh, in the market for this stock? You know, so you can get this uh, you can get this uh, idea of what that trading activity it is. Is. Now here's, look at the second bullet point. This is a good bullet point for you to think about for an exam question. Of course, if we're talking about a company like Johnson & Johnson or McDonald's, you know, what, what do they do? They trade, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of shares possibly every day. So we're probably not going to be able to have this transaction-based manipulation in companies like that, but smaller firms, of course. How about another example question here? False rumors about the acquisition of a competing firm. All right, pumps up the price of the stock, but it is unsuccessful. So the question is, is this a violation? And the emphasis is on unsuccessful. So you should be thinking along the following lines. You should say to yourself, wait a minute, it wasn't successful, therefore nobody was hurt, so this is not a violation. Nope, nope, nope. Uh, look at the answer down here. The outcome of the attempt is, uh, is irrelevant. Uh, under the standard, the intent of the actions would be the only, only consideration. All right, so there's standard two. What I want you to do now is the same thing I asked you to do back in standard one. Do you remember what I said to you at the end of the video or somewhere inside of that video? I wanted you to go to the reading and I want you to look at those 34, 35 questions. I want you to do them and you can do them fairly quickly. Um, but I want you to do them. Now, we've only done two out of the seven, so you're just two sevenths of the way there. But I'm going to ask you to do this after all seven of these so that you kind of not have them memorize those questions. But I think those are really good examples to, uh, to prepare yourself for these questions on the exam. And then once we go over this seven times, come on, bear with me here. You're going to say, Jim, boy, isn't that kind of overkill or whatever? Uh, remember, I am a professional and I know what I'm talking about. So uh, thanks for watching and good luck studying. Next time we'll do standard three and there are five components to that one.